Tier 1, Chapter 35. Kate has an act of rebellion. Chapter 35. What do I tell Nick? This is the only question on my mind when I wake up, feeling slightly more sane, but still missing the answers I so desperately need. I am supposed to meet with Nick this afternoon. Would it be appropriate to ask him to wait until after the celebration? That would give me time to think, time for the boys to do therapy if we go forward with that. Every part of me feels stiff, and my neck aches. I have to decompress before I get another headache. The door to my bedroom opens. Hey, Mom, Bentley says, jumping up on the bed with me. I grab him and hug him close. I can't breathe, he says, laughing. Sorry, I needed a hug this morning, I say, plastering on a smiling facade. I'm hungry. I knew you would be, I laugh. Go on out and I'll come make breakfast. He runs out with his pants falling down as usual. I sit up and tap my sensor, sending a message to Nick. Hey, yesterday was rough. I think we are going to need a bit more time before officially moving forward with this. Can we plan on waiting until after the peace celebration? I completely forgot about it, and the boys look forward to it every year. I am hoping to do some preparation with them this week. Want to join in on celebration planning tomorrow? P.S. I am so sorry to put this off. I am doing my best, Nick. I know this isn't easy for you. I know this sounds like a total cop-out, but it's the best I can do. The repercussions of these decisions determine everything, and it's too much for my brain to take in. I breathe. I will take Eric's lead and trust my instincts as well. Entering the kitchen, I assemble oats, salt, and apples to make oatmeal. Tal is going to complain, but it's all I have the energy for right now. I squeeze half a lemon into a glass of water and take a drink while I wait for the pot to boil. Bent woke me up. Tal complains, pointing to Bentley as they enter the room. It's time for breakfast, Bentley announces excitedly. Let's let people wake up naturally, okay, I say. If he sleeps in really long, I'll let you know when to wake him up. Kay, says Bentley, somewhat disappointed. Hey guys, guess what is happening next week? They stare at me blankly. It's the peace celebration, I say with exaggerated enthusiasm. What? That's next week? Says Tal as Bentley looks at me wide-eyed. Yes! I have been so busy I completely forgot about it. I remember they said something in conditioning last week, but I forgot to remind you, Bentley says, throwing his arms up in the air. His energy is contagious. You guys have been busy too. It's totally fine. We still have plenty of time to plan, I say, giving the oatmeal a final stir, then reach into the fridge to pull out the blueberries and walnuts. Tal pulls two bowls out of the cupboard, and Bentley picks the spoons out of the drawer. I am impressed that Tal hasn't said anything yet about the oatmeal. Maybe all this excitement is a good enough distraction. What are they doing this year? Tal asks. I'm not actually sure. I was thinking I would look it up after breakfast. Can you look it up now? We could read about it while we eat. Let me take a few bites, and then I will, I say, hurriedly adding my blueberries and slurping some of it down. I pull out my tablet and turn on the display, directing it to the community website. The first image we see is of a gigantic balloon. That's a hot air balloon! We learned about those at school! Bentley says. I'm guessing that this is the main event at the celebration, I say as I manipulate the image to see the information below it. Yep, check it out. It says here that they will be doing a balloon launch on Saturday morning, early. Hey, Bent, maybe you could wake Tal up that day. I say, teasing. Tal rolls his eyes, but smiles. Do you guys want to do it? I've never been on one. It looks like we can take a ride if we want, or we can just watch. Are they really dangerous, like they fly with a ball of fire in them or something? Tal asks. I think there's definitely a reason we don't use them anymore, but I don't think they are dangerous for small rides. Who knows? I haven't actually ever seen one in person. The boys both get a kick out of me not knowing something. I remember when the air of mystery surrounding my parents' expertise began to burst for me, and I felt the same way. The best was when I knew something they didn't. 
One time, my dad was having trouble figuring out how to use his new health sensor. I was eight at the time and had just seen my instructor showing someone else how to use it in conditioning. I immediately jumped in and taught dad how it worked. The look on his face was priceless. After that, I wanted to earn that look from him every single day. I take another bite of oatmeal and see a call coming through on my sensor. It's Eric, and I panic, almost choking on my food. I haven't had enough time to figure out a plan of action. Tal reaches over and answers before I can stop him. Dad, are you coming home today? I hear Eric take in a deep breath. I wish. I'm actually a territory away. How are you guys doing? Mom is showing us the hot air balloons for the peace celebration, says Bentley excitedly. She is? That's so cool. Hey, can I actually talk to Mom privately for a minute? Yes, I say, laughing at the boys' pouty faces. I promise you can talk for a few more minutes after, okay? That seems to appease them. I turn my sensor to private and walk out onto the patio. Hey, I say quietly. Hey, Kate. There's a long pause. I don't know what to say. I mean, I do know what I want to say, but it's complicated. How do I tell Eric that Nick and I... How do I tell Nick? I can't even form a complete sentence in my brain, let alone out loud. Eric breaks the silence, clearing his throat. So, like I mentioned, I'm just calling to figure out logistics. I... I need to pick up my things from the house, and I thought that might be best to do when the, when the kids aren't home. He stammers, struggling to get through this. His face from yesterday haunts me. I have never seen him in such terrible condition before, and it isn't like we haven't been through hard times together. We have both lost our parents, and my mind transports me to four years ago. We had been cleared to have a third child. We conceived easily, as always, but lost the baby at around ten weeks' gestation. It was terrifying for me. I had felt some cramping and called my doctor, but he told me that there really wasn't much to do besides wait and see. At that young age, the baby wouldn't be viable. All tests up to that point had seemed normal, and I think that's why it was so hard. We had already made plans. We hadn't told the boys yet, since I was still in the first trimester, so at least they were spared. Eric took it extremely hard, mostly because analysis showed that his DNA contribution caused the miscarriage. It was doubly hard because we found out shortly thereafter that we were not cleared to try again. He felt like a failure, despite my constant insistence that it wasn't the case and took a few months to come out of it. Even then, he never looked as bad as he did yesterday. The pain in his voice strikes me deeply, and I can't handle it. Maybe you could do it the morning of the peace celebration, I blurt out. In that moment, I don't know if I'm right, but I do know what I'm going to do. I care about Nick, but this is Eric. I have tried embracing the societal ideal, but I can't live in a world where I know I didn't try every possible option to stay with the man I love and have committed to. If we crash and burn, if Berg moves us to Tier 2, if Eric becomes bitter and depressed, I guess I will have to live with that. I repeat to myself that this plan of action represents where I am at, nothing more. There is no blame, just observation of my brain coming to conclusions. It's easier to accept that than feel responsible for the potential breakdown of my family. And another incredible human being and generations of people who will suffer for my decision. I force myself to stop thinking about it. Eric's voice is throaty when he speaks. As it turns out, I asked for leave to attend, so that works great. I will be there. We are planning to attend the balloon launch in the morning, I say. I'm not sure what else we will be attending, but we will definitely be there at 7 a.m. I will plan on that timing then. Thanks for everything, he says and trails off. My eyes fill with tears, and for the first time in months, my heart feels full. I will meet Eric in a week, and we will be together. I focus on that and not all of the unknowns that come along with it. Have a great week, Eric. Thanks. Enjoy the balloons. It's like we are dating again. Neither one of us wants to be the first to end the call. 
I remember I promised the boys they could talk, so I tell Eric to hold on. They can be the ones to sign off. After they talk for a few minutes and end the call, we get on our bikes and ride to conditioning. The boys chatter nonstop about the celebration and how they can't wait to discuss everything with their friends. We have missed quite a few classes lately, and I didn't realize how much they look forward to sharing and talking with kids their age. It's been a while since they have played with anyone besides each other, I realize. I should set something up. Before I start the ride home, I check my sensor and see that Nick has responded. My stomach drops. I select the message and begin reading. Hey, Kate. I am so sorry it was tough. I expected it would be hard for all of you, and honestly, it's hard for me knowing you are in pain. I feel somewhat responsible, even though... Even though... I just want you to know that I love you. Take all the time you need. If you want someone to talk to, I am here. Would love to help with celebration planning. I'm smiling, and I immediately want to slap myself in the face. How can I be smiling at a message from the man I am about to leave after we paired? I think back to all of the things he shared about feeling rejected, alone, unable to find someone to move forward with. Tears start rolling down my cheeks. He is young, and I know he will find someone else, but I might be a terrible person. The most terrible person. I want to curl up and sob. I see someone walking up the street and don't want to attract attention or have to explain my emotional distress, so I start writing. I zone out as I pedal. When I pull up in front of my house, I wish I would have continued on. Grace is sitting on my front porch. <laughs>